Hey guys, in this video the lovely team is going to be taking you through factors affecting conformity. This is something you need for your A-level psychology and to help you remember all the facts and all the little bits you need to for this, over on my website there is a whole set of multiple choice questions just waiting for you. To quickly recap the terminology that we discussed in the last video and the last part of this unit of psychology, let's have a look at types of conformity and the explanations for this conformity. There are three basic types of conformity. Internalization is conforming and behaving in a certain way because you have internally convinced yourself that you genuinely feel or behave in that way. Compliance is conforming with a majority view or a majority behavior despite your own disagreement or doubts. This is done as a way of fitting in and being accepted as part of that majority. And identification is conforming to specific behaviours in order to fulfil a predefined role in society or role in a larger social group. There are two major explanations for this conformity. ISI, or informational social influence, is altering your behaviour based on information that you have gained from those around you. NSI, or normative social influence, is altering your behaviour based on widespread and accepted social norms and practices. We also looked at two major pieces of research, which are very relevant for the topics that we'll be discussing later on. Sheriff did a piece, of, a piece of research in 1935. He conducted a laboratory experiment under controlled laboratory conditions, which was based on participants estimating the movement of a dot of light in a darkened room. However, the light had not actually moved but participants were deceived into expecting it to move by being told that a researcher would be moving it. In individual testing, the participants came to individual conclusions, but these approached an average or mean when they were tested in a larger group. It then remained near this average or mean when they were again tested individually. Despite some ethical issues which we've discussed, such as the deliberate deception of participants, this study in 1935 did establish a link between information received and behaviour informational social influence. Ash, in 1951, did another piece of research. He conducted again an experiment which was based on participants selecting matching lines from a series of options they were given. A control group showed that this was an easy task and people only got it wrong about 0.7% of the time. Each group of eight, however, only had one real, actual participant and they were unaware of the remaining seven who were confederates of the researcher who gave deliberate, incorrect answers first. Despite some obvious deception-based ethical issues, participants conformed to the majority, and Ash was able, with this research, to provide proof for normative social influence. People were basing their actions and decisions on norms established in the wider group. Explaining conformity with these two explanations, ISI and NSI, is usually called the two-process approach to conformity, and as you may expect, this approach has advantages, some good points, and also some disadvantages or bad points. These are the advantages. This approach is easily understood. It's therefore a useful tool in explaining compliance and conformity, especially to people unfamiliar with psychology. Most research that's been done, such as that that we've already seen, does point towards compliance and conformity resulting from one of these two processes. These processes are also easy to test in a controlled and repeated way under laboratory conditions. Testing can also be done for these processes and explanations, and usually this will result in some form of numerical data. This allows for data analysis to be done on these statistics, and clear trends can be established. There are, however, also disadvantages. There is, as we've seen, very significant variation between individuals. Some people are highly influenced by ISI, or by NSI, or by both, whereas others are unaffected by them. This tends to depend on the personality and experiences of each particular individual. The presence of a single dissenting voice can also have huge effects. A single dissenting voice introduced into the ASH experiment in 1951 produced massively different results. NSI and ISI can both be reduced by dissent. This raises questions about if they are independent from each other. It's likely that there are many factors which influence both, and therefore the NSI and ISI are massively intertwined. There are many factors which affect conformity and therefore many factors which influence how likely or easy it is that an individual will conform to a wider group. Some people do not conform at all to a wider group. They act completely independently. The factors which affect conformity can be divided into two large subsections or groups, situational factors 
and dispositional factors. Situational factors are dependent on the social environment that a person is in. They will vary from environment to environment and from social group to social group. Dispositional factors are specific to that individual. They will not vary between environments or social groups, but they will vary from person to person. As you may expect, a key factor which affects conformity is the size of the wider social group. You may expect that conformity would increase with a group size. A much larger majority is more difficult to dissent from. If there is a much larger number of people presenting the same opinion, the same answer or the same behaviour, then surely it becomes much more difficult for any one individual to dissent comfortably from that wider, larger group. To investigate this, Ash, who we've already seen, conducted some further research about five years after the initial research, and a similar method to before was used. Participants were asked to judge the length of a line against four other possible answers. This time, however, the group size was varied. Instead of the previous seven confederates, initially only two were present. These were the people who deliberately gave incorrect answers to try and lead the one real participant down the wrong path. This group size was then gradually increased, the idea being to try and establish a trend between conformity and the size of the wider group. Ash found this. When only two confederates were present, conformity was 14%. Still there, but quite low. But when three confederates were present, conformity rose to 32%. It over doubled. Past this point, however, where three confederates were present, there was actually little change in conformity. And the conclusion was therefore this. Conformity does indeed generally increase with the size of the wider social group, but only to a given point. Past this point, conformity does not change very much with the size of the group. Another example of a situational factor is social support. Social support means having someone with you in that social group who agrees with you rather than the wider social group. This naturally increases self-confidence and therefore it's likely to reduce conformity. Ash therefore again repeated this time another confederate was introduced, one who would deliberately and always agree with whatever the one sole real participant said. This confederate therefore became a fellow dissenter, someone else who disagreed with the wider group and agreed with the confederate. In doing this, they broke the unanimity of the wider group. They broke the one sole answer that was presented to the real participant. This made it much easier for the one real participant to dissent themselves. When this variable was introduced and another dissenter was introduced, conformity fell sharply. It went down to 5.5%. And the conclusion that was therefore drawn was this. Conformity becomes much less likely when dissenters are not alone, and a fellow dissenter breaks the unanimity of the wider group. Another example of a situational factor is the difficulty of the task. The difficulty of the task being attempted or problem being solved has an influence on how likely individuals are to conform to a wider group. A harder task makes it much less likely that the participant will be confident that their dissenting opinion will be right, so they become much more likely to defer and conform to the wider group consensus that's developed. To test this, Ash increased the difficulty of the task. It was made significantly more difficult to tell which line matched the standard line. When this variable was changed, conformity became much, much more likely. Individual participants were much less confident that their answer was correct. They therefore deferred to the wider group, the answers of which they'd already seen as they went nearly last, and gave an incorrect answer. The conclusion that was therefore drawn was this. As the difficulty of the task increases, the rate at which individuals conform also generally increases. One example of a dispositional factor specific to the individual person is confidence or expertise. Debriefed the participants a trend was found. Those people who had confidence in their answer or expertise in the subject were much less likely to conform to the wider group. Ash therefore concluded this, when an individual has some expertise, they gain in self-confidence, their belief in their own ability. And this makes them much less likely to conform to a wider group answer that they view based on their confidence and expertise in the subject as being incorrect. A higher self-esteem or personal confidence also makes it much less likely that an individual will conform. They have much less need to be accepted or fit in, and they're therefore much more likely to risk a dissenting voice because they're not really bothered if they're ostracized or pushed out of the wider group. They have their own self-confidence to fall back on. Some research was done to test this conclusion. In 1976, Weisenthal 
found that if people felt competent in a task, they were less likely to conform and more likely to dissent from the wider group opinion that had been formed. In 1980, Perrin and Spencer replicated the ASH experiment from the 50s. However, they used engineering students. These engineering students had expertise and therefore confidence in geometry and shape and line. They found that conformity dropped very sharply. The students, based on their own expertise and self-confidence, felt confident in their answer, in their dissenting voice. They were therefore willing to risk ostracization and risk not fitting in with the wider group to dissent. A second dispositional factor is gender. The traditionalist view of psychology is that women are more likely to conform than men. This view held sway until the 1970s, when wider changes in society and gender roles led psychologists to try and establish, as a matter of fact, if gender was actually a dispositional factor in conformity. In the 1980s, further research was done by Eagley and Carly, which cast a lot of doubt on this traditional viewpoint. In 1981, they did some meta-analysis. Meta-analysis is an analysis of previous research, taking lots of previous research and using it to try and establish an overall pattern or trend, to try and establish if any trends in gender were present in the results of many previous studies. They did find some differences between the results of men and women, as you may expect. However, these were extremely inconsistent and they led to no firm overall trends being found. Eagley, in 1987, put forward an argument. The argument was that men and women had traditionally had differing roles within society. The theory was that women value social harmony and cohesiveness more, and they're therefore more likely to conform to the group to maintain this social harmony and cohesiveness. The theory said that men, however, value traits such as assertiveness and independence. They're therefore much more likely, based on these traits, to dissent from a wider group opinion in order to fulfill this perceived traditional social role.